Dow Anderson landed on Utah Beach, Normandy, in July of 1944 with the 6th Armored Division. During the next nine and a half months, the 6th Armored Division fought in five major European campaigns of World War II. On April 10, 1945, Dow was seriously wounded in action, thus earning the Purple Heart. Okay, tell me your name. Dow Anderson. And where are you from? Blood County. Blood County. Where did you go to school? I went to, well, I went one year at Everett and finished at Friendswood. Okay. And what year did you finish? 1943. 1943. And were you drafted? Uh, in June of that same year. Okay. Just as quick as I got out of high school. They was going to draft me, us guys, before, around the Christmas time, but they deferred us to we graduated. Okay. And once you got drafted, where did they tell you to report? I had to go to Fort Overthorpe, Georgia. Okay. And how did, did you get there by train? Bus. By a bus. Yeah. And what, once you got off the bus, they processed you in? Yeah. Yeah, we spent our, I don't know how many days, after cake, doing KP and guard duty and all what all. Picking and, up cigarette butts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, World War II was already going on, so yeah. you kind of, I guess you figured that you were heading, heading to war. Yeah. Well, see, I had... Two brothers already in. Okay. And from being at Fort Oglethorpe, where where did they send you? I went to uh, uh, Alabama. Uh, I forget what the name of camp was. That's okay. And I'll think of a minute. <laughs> and when you Fort went McClellan. Fort McClellan, and when you went there, did you get assigned to a unit or you training for a certain type of job? We went into we went into a sort of a staging area, uh, and they was going to, if there was units need to be filled mm -hmm. that was going overseas, they they picked us out. They sent, that's the reason they sent me to Fort Bay, Maryland, man, because that was sort of a separation places where they divided the, well, and it was, it was cold, it was winter time, up there in the sand blue, and one day we, they, give us their clothes like this, thin clothes, take all of the window stuff away from us. In two, three days, they said, well, you're going for it's cold, Europe. And uh, they'd like to war us out. And they, they put us through all kinds of skirmish over there, back problems and everything like that. So they told you you're going to Europe. Yeah. And how did, how did you get to Europe? Well, first they shipped me from Fort Meade to uh, Camp Shanks, New York, which is a, at that particular time was a secret, sort of a secret base. It was in north, north of New York City, and uh, no one was supposed to, even the people around there weren't even supposed to know that base was there because it was, it was really pretty wild out there. And uh, while I was there, the unit I was with. Uh, they, uh, I came down with appendicitis and had an op operation. And I was in there about 10 or 12 days. And when I got out, I don't know where my fellow soldiers were or where they were, and I never did hear from them again. But I think we were going to go to North Africa, someplace. That's the last I heard, but I never did know where they were. Whatever happened to them. And I was in, when I got out of the hospital, they put me in a, a, a pool, you know, where they just put people in. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, I'm sitting there one night. And what they doing, they was putting me all through basic training again with the new recruits, you know. I figured myself, I was a veteran after I got older. <laughs> and this uh, lieutenant came in and, and a sergeant, and they said they were looking for Private Anderson. And I looked up like it, and I said, that's me. They said, well, consider yourself right now. See, I was in the infantry. They said, you're in the Army, armored, 6th Armored Division. And that's, I stayed with them until the war was over. 
I had some good, good real good friends. And this lieutenant I worked for, he and I, we were, uh, I was uh, rated as a combat messenger. And he was a liaison officer, which he was over the, the people that uh, I was associated with. And we don't know where work at night. We didn't know hardly where we were going. We, we'd go and we'd take our, um, our orders from headquarters and go out to each of the combat commands or, it, or the companies and deliver the messages. And that was pretty hairy because the Germans were every place. Especially when we was in the Brest Peninsula in Normandy. Our guys may be in one field in the German. Uh, I guess you've heard about the hedgerows. Mm -hmm. That's that's the French when they still have a build a wire fence, they they take all the they keep all the centuries, they take the rock and they these hedge bushes comes up in them so and it's just like a fort. Wow. So tell me how did where did you land, I mean, when you got to Europe? I landed I landed in uh, uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Beautiful sight I've ever seen. They've been on the water for 13 days or so. And I believe it was called the Arrow River. It was off from the ocean several miles. And I can remember uh, we was going up this river. And they had all kinds of manufacturing plants there. Most of them was women working. And I won't tell you what they did, but they gave us a welcome. <laughs> but it was, I was just started just a little while, and then they shipped us into central uh, England, near all, I guess about 20 miles from Paris, I mean London. And that's where we stayed until we got ready to go to Omaha. Okay, so, um were you weren't in the first wave oh, no. for D-Day? No, because that was up to the, uh, mostly the Rangers, artillery, and infantry. And uh, I don't know how, I can't remember how many miles. I think we traveled up maybe 10 miles in, something like that. And just beyond Omaha Beach, there's a lot of swamp land. And they blowed all the bridges. And started filling them in dirt so they could, or tanks and stuff would get through. But the Germans, they made a big stand, and I think it's an eye. You may not want to hear about it, but you couldn't stand the stink. There was dead Americans and, and Germans every place. And you just, you just had to put it in your mind this, this is war, and it's going to happen. You know? And I see a lot of that happen, which I have not talked too much about over, over the years. But I've, I've seen enough death. It just hmm. is beyond belief. Right. And were you all fighting right away once you got yeah. to... See, my job in the service, although I took training for it, it wasn't front line. Through. I was up there a lot. And had to go a lot, but I didn't. I slept in foxholes and slit trenches and stuff like that, and now guard posts. But it's been there. You've seen pictures of World War One, you know, there's in these trenches and all that. That wasn't the kind of, that kind of war. This World War Two wasn't like that. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're talking about World War Two, yeah. the trenches. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I never did. I never did have to go up on it and just stay, stay day after day, day after, like, like the other guys. I always felt sorry for them. I know we was, took a town just before we went into Germany, and we have been on the move for quite a while, snow on the ground, wet, cold, and riding in the Jeep like that. They, my whole, I remember my whole side here was covered with dirt and stuff like that. And it's convoy trucks come through there and they had new recruits in them. I could tell that they were new recruits because they had all new uniforms on them. And 
a to mu ty nasi abstio jo by ta se dušo kisto morte on into and he said oh, they'll soon find out and they had a attack that night in the middle. and we had to go on a mission and place two with that battle with us had that battle and I could pick up those young kids by their uniforms and it was heartbreaking I mean you know they just like me they just went as lucky but that happened that happened over and over time and time We was, one time we ran out of food and looked at, Lieutenant Algeria led that convoy to go back to the rails head and get the food. But some of the guys I'd been serving with, they went with them, they was, had rank, they were sergeants. So they took about four, five, six, six with sixes. And it's luckily I was with them, they went around the curve and they, there was a, couple of truckloads of German soldiers. <clears throat> so they started firing at each other. And far as I know, one came back to the company. He was a sergeant. He was the only one who escaped. Rest of course I can find out. They were some of them were killed, supposedly, and some of them was taken hostage as prisoners. And they of course, it was a good thing for them. <clears throat> they took them down in Lorient. Uh, the Germans had a submarine base on the ground, and they served the whole war down there, uh, doing KP and cooking and stuff like that. And they were really lucky in a way, you know. And, and I got to meet those guys when, again, when, when the war was over with. And, and they said, part of the time, since we didn't see the vessels coming on, Everything come under the water. Nothing Germans. They had these submarine uh, things built under the water. They come in the submarines and go out. You never seen it. They said you never see a ship on the, on the water. And they had the life of Riley there. <laughs> so, what you were in the what, what the sixth armor division? Sixth armor division. And um, did did that your was, I was in the third army. Okay, third army. Yeah. Did uh, what was life like? I mean, I know you described some of the the battles, but with food, was food always short? Or well, yeah, we especially when we was the Battle of the Bulge, we did how much. I worked several days. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they had different kinds of rations. They had one that looked like a chocolate bar, and it was hard. You'd have to take your trench knife and shave it off. To we'd make hot chocolate, put it in hot water, and we'd have C rations and D rations. But when I was in France, especially, if we got a chance to the village or something or other, or the people over there they were hard up for soap to wash their clothing with, and I could trade. My mother kept sending me soap, soap all the time. I could trade soap for eggs and stuff, and in fact I get my hand. And I, I was a pretty good cook, and and I had, in my Jeep, I carried two or three of these gas burners. Then I had some skillets, and we got a break. Uh, for several of the guys, not all of them, just because too many of them, but I, I cooked for them. <laughs> and I enjoyed it really. You know. but, uh, so I'm sure they took good care of you. <laughs> Yeah, I can't crap. I tell you, the guys were good to me. I had a bunch of guys to serve with there. Uh, they called me. I was, I, I was the youngest one in my company. I, of course, I, I had been called several kinds of names, but they called me Babe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was either Babe or Andy, you know, for Anderson. It was, uh, this lieutenant I served for, he was a great guy. And, uh, I got acquainted. His mother would write to uh, write him a letter, and she say, "Tell Andy I said hi to And my mother, she'd bake cakes and stuff and ship them overseas, and she'd do the same thing. And he, 
she'd always put up and say, be sure to Andy gets some wounds. <laughs> so tell us about being wounded in action. Well, we had just taken this town, making south of Germany, and our infantry and they had a pretty fierce, fierce battle there. So we come by later. The battle was still going on the outskirts of town, from where it sounded. And we just going to get a break, or like we had been promised once the Trot War got interrupted when we were in Metz, Germany. And it looked at it, we'd been on the drive, and we were, our vehicles hadn't been, had any maintenance working on them for a long time. And he said, thought it'd be a good idea if I go down and check the vehicle out and, and everything. And I went down there and I was working and kaboom. The Germans counterattacked. The ground troops never did get to her, but they had all artillery. And I got knocked out with my plane, a bomb. They went off in the roof just above me and they strafed us. And uh, I didn't know I was hit. But I next building to me at the door there. I, I dived into that and hit the ground, and I didn't know I was hit, but I, uh, I started to stand up, and I looked down, and my field jacket there had a big burnt like hole in it. And when I stood up then, I felt something wrong hot then. Then I knew I was hit. I got three pieces of shrapnel in my chest. And I got hysterical, of course I can remember. And some, my comrades were so part of me, and I, I started running toward him and calling on him, on him. And I remember my sergeant said, he said, help, 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 he said, said babe has been hit. And I had enough of conscience to tell me one of the guys, a sergeant was on a um, Sherman tank, and he had parked it right up close to a tree, and I remember seeing this, I see it today, as, he had a big piece of shrapnel just above his head. I mean, it was big. And they called the ambulance medics in, and just before they put me into the ambulance, there was a second lieutenant. His, his whole leg was pulled off. And they put me in the ambulance with me, and then I, then I went in shock. Or they said I've been in shock. And they took me to a evacuation field. I went to Sackler Field Hospital. And because all this stuff was on my, <laughs> they stripped me all naked. And I was on a stretcher, and they just, the only thing I had on with the GI blanket on. No shoes. And the Germans counterattacked. And the only thought that came in my mind, I was going to be captured naked. <laughs> and that worried me more. <laughs> if that was, that was an awful feeling. And Where did they take you? What? They took me to a field hospital. I can't remember exactly how I got there. I went parked by an ambulance, and they took me to a field hospital. It was right on next to the Audubon, that's the super high van in Germany. And they operated on me about 10 o'clock at night. And there's a little Jewish doctor that did the operation because he talked to me afterwards. My biggest fear was that when I was getting ready for the operation and after the operation, about two hours they come in and give you a penicillin shot. Well, that needle started out about that long. The time they got through, it seems like it was about that long. And in the meantime, I was laying there, help, frankly helpless. I could walk. The Germans were looking for our convoy, and they were straight from the highway. And I stayed there for a while, and they shipped me out to a, an airstrip, a corrugated airstrip, you know, they just laid that metal, make a landing place. They hold 
gasoline in for their vehicles and the wounded out. And they had hangers hanging all around the fusion lots with O-rings on it. And they fit, they would fit right in on those stretchers and they had us all the way around. Then we went so far there and then they put us on a train into Dijon, France. And that was a rough ride. They called them 48-8s. Back World War I they had them. They called it 48-8s because there's 40 men and 8 horses. That's what they carried. Well, while I was in, I was riding, I was still on the stretcher. There's a piece of metal come from someplace and stuck in my eye. And it liked to run me crazy before we got to the hospital. And that's the first thing he done. When I got to 36 General Hospital, they took me straight to the operating room to take that piece of metal out of my eye. And uh, well, from then on, the war was over with me, for me. Or how did you get back to the, the United States? Well, when I got out of the hospital, well, before I got out of the hospital, the war was over with, and they they just took their time now, getting rid of us. And I'd been there in that hospital for over, at least a hundred days. I felt like I was part of the staff there, <laughs> but they. They busted in that hospital and they, instead of sending me back to my unit, they sent me to a replacement pool. And I was in that replacement pool with guys that just taking basic training. And there's another guy that I knew there, he was in the infantry. I found out where my company now fit was at. And we had a long week going on, but we had to be back Monday morning at 7 o'clock for curfew if it didn't, would be cold marshal. He and I hitchhiked away, all, I would say all the way across Germany, we hitchhiked day and night. When we got to our unit, uh, we couldn't stay for a few hours ago, we had to be back. And I told Lieutenant Kruger, I said, we got to go back. And he said, when? I said, we got to start back. I said, we got to be there for care for your morning. So they said they'd court marshals. He said, they don't want to do that. He says, I'll just go back with you. Take a vehicle and go with you. I don't know how many miles it was. Well, he couldn't go, so he sent a staff sergeant and a buck sergeant with me. And we walked in, because we were late. And this sergeant, I don't know how long he'd been there, but he was going to throw the book at us. And this one of my sergeants told me, he said, you're not going to do nothing. He said, we're here to take him back to his unit. We said, we're going to take him now. And that's how I got back to my unit. So. Hmm. When did they award you with the Purple Heart? And when I was in the hospital. In the hospital. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. 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 I was already, you know, Pretty much back myself. You know, like, okay. Uh, Did they do a ceremony or just hand it to you? or? Uh, there was an officer who came in and a couple, three nurses. And we was in a ward where there was, I guess, maybe 10 or 12 guys, you know, and they all kind of hovered around. And, and, uh, but uh, I can remember it well. There's a lot of stuff. That, that's the reason I had this stuff written down there because of my age. Like I said, my oldest daughter, she said, Dad, said, when you think of this stuff, he said, you write it down, just give notes, and said, we'll put it together. Like it. And that's what I do. And right now, I guess I'm <clears throat> still living for the future. I'm living in the past. And I could, I, I have nightmares. They're not, they're not bad or anything. But a lot of them is, is about the war and other subjects. But I get to the place that I, I get the stuff on my mind, and I can't get rid of it. And it's not real bad or anything, but it's. I want to go to sleep. Most of the time I sleep, 
I've got four or five beds, but I sleep mostly in the recliner because I rest easier there. But I guess when you get old, you start reminiscing too much. So when, when you were discharged, what, what kind of reception did you get? A anything? Didn't that? know. No, they come in and call, talk to us. <clears throat> and I was in um, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. And we had to, they called us in, and we had sat, like soldiers deposit where we could put our money in while we were in the service, or if we had any credentials or anything, awards coming to us. We had to do it right then, because they said you couldn't get out the gate to MPs with that job gate unless you have all of this stuff, and you discharge. Well, when we come out of that building, we had to go into another building, and I guess this is partly my fault where I'm at today. We had to go to Baltimore to catch our way home. It was about four or five of us, and it was taxi drivers. They said, anybody go to Baltimore? I said, yeah. I said, here's three or four of us. And they didn't even stop us at the gate because they wanted to send a taxi, I guess. And that's, that's the way I come home. I, come, uh, I, was, I, rec I think I started out in Cincinnati and then in Baltimore. And then caught the train in the box. And was your family waiting for you? They didn't know I was in the United States. I uh, I didn't write them tell them I was coming home. And a couple of friends that was traveling with me on the train, some of the little folks was waiting for me. I came in on one, I came in on, I believe it was Elden Inn, and to catch the White Star Line bus to Maryland, I had to go all the way across town. And just because I've been traveling with these other guys, they volunteered to take me to the bus station. I didn't call no one. And that was about five o'clock in the morning. And a little company where my dad worked, uh, there's a work bus runs. And I happened to just get there just in time. We caught that bus at home and we had a long driveway. I can remember just this was yesterday, my youngest brother, he was in the service there and he didn't go to the Corail. He about halfway down there and he looked up and he said, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, don't be too loud. I said, where's mom? And dad was working. And she said, he, she's in the kitchen. And I said, don't say a word. And I shouldn't have done it. But I walked right in on her. And she was putting up biscuits in the oven. And I just said, I hope you got enough for me. <laughs> that was a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> what did she do? I just, you know, I wouldn't want, don't get me wrong, I had it easy compared to some of the guys I've seen. I was very fortunate, although it's several ups and downs and some real close calls. But I've always felt sorry for the others because although I didn't, I wasn't with them all the time, did, but I seen what there was up against. And, uh, like, I had a chance when we took, after the Battle of the Bulge, we went to a place, it was a resort town called Clermont. That was in Belgium, I believe it was. Well, they looked at all of our records, and I had advanced, advanced, Temperature training, and they were looking for platoon leaders. And they said, "What about?" They picked me and another guy. Said, "What about you going?" They set up an OCS school in Paris, and says, "What do you think about going to OCS?" And it says, "In about six or eight weeks, you'll come out of the second lieutenant." And I wasn't interested at all because I asked, I questioned them. I said, "Well, of course, I knew something about it." When you're in battle, 
And if you're a squad leader, a company leader, if you have an assault, if you're safe here on the ground, if you have an assault, that leader has to be the first to go to the top. And I said, in actual combat on an assault, what's the lifespan? He said about 40 seconds. I was so surprised. That was the initial thing, you know, when he went over the top, the enemy was all out there. He said about 40 seconds. I didn't want no part of it. I wanted to go home. <laughs> What kind of career did you have? What what did you do for a living after you got out of the service? Well, I, I did several things. Before I went into service, I was still in high school. Uh, the people that owned Sanderson Lumber Company, Jim Coleman, he built houses here in Blount County. He was building houses in anticipation for the veterans when they come back. And I worked for summer months there, and I was working for them when I got drafted. And then when I got out of service, Dad, I told Dad I got out in November. And I just I wasn't satisfied. I said I got to go to work or do something like I've been doing. And he said, "Well, I've got a little money." He said, "You've been gone almost three years." He said, "Take it easy." I t I went to the first of the year. I couldn't take it any longer, and I went to Luna because. I worked there about two years, got married, and my wife, she worked for Knoxville Power Company, which is, I'll call that now. We had some friends that lived in California, came on vacation, and they said, why don't you go back to California with us? I didn't give any thought. We went to bed at night. I said, how would you like to go to California? I said, I've been all over Europe. And I said, you've not been in place. I don't know where you've been out in Blood County or not. <clears throat> we decided we'd just go to California. We got up out of bed, dressed, went out to the door and said, we believe we'll go to California with you. He said, we're leaving in 10 days. We were supposed to work out 15 day notice. We, I told the boss, he tried to talk me out of it. I was a chemical analyst. He tried to talk me out of it. And I said, I didn't know you was talking. I said, we've been up a mile ago. He said, well, let's take a leave of absence. Well, I said, leave of absence, you have to, when you, the leave is up, you have to come back if you were good. I said, oh, we're just going to leave. We stayed up there five years. So. And then you came we start, back? We started a family in California. Then I moved back here. I, worked, I went back to Alcoa. And then once in a while, you get laid off. I had several jobs. I worked for Kroger's. Yeah, because in California, I worked for Safeway stores, which was a good outfit. And and I worked in some private markets, which I enjoyed. <clears throat> and then I went back to Alcoa. And I stayed there 30 years. <laughs> wow. So it's it's been 70 years since the end of World War II. Yeah. And what what's it like today being a veteran of World War II and being thanked and... Well, watching television, I think I get it ready to eat off. Seems like every time there's, there's a budget cut or something like that, the veterans get the short end of it. And in the hospitals, just like about these hearing aids, the process is too long. I know some veterans died before they ever got what they were supposed to have. And the people that are in charge, a lot of us never been in the service, really. And they really don't realize the needs for our veterans. When I go to bed at night, I pray every night. But there's one thing I always pray for, is the men and women that's in the service and the veterans. Because I'm, I'm deeply in, entrenched in that process. Like my brother, he got locked, knocked out at St. Lowe by an artillery blast. 
loaded completely out of the foxhole. He hit in the foxhole beside him, but blew, the concussion loaded him and his buddy out of his foxhole. And he wasn't worth a dime after that. They shipped him back to England. And this is what I'm getting to about the way they treat the veterans. And they finally gave him medical discharge. They gave him 62% of his disability. I was living in California at that time. And he right and tell me. Just every few months or so, they take that national veterans hospital. They take 10 or 20% away from it every time. And he wasn't getting no better. He, was, he got married, had a family, but he worked with alcohol, but he was thin. And I knew he was having nightmares. And they finally took his whole pension away from him. And I found out about it. I was moved to California. I said, we're thinking about coming back. And I said, if you'll do it. I said, I'm in earnest about this. I said, we'll give us a couple pup tents. We'll go to Washington, D.C. And we camp out on the Capitol steps. And I meant it, because I was so wrought up. But he's one of these easy kind of guys, and he, he didn't want to do it. But I just, it's not because I was in the service, but my whole family's in service, my brother in law, and all the friends. And when I see them being mistreated, it just, it breaks my heart. And I got a feeling, I, I had a place in Florida, and we would travel down. A lot of times, I, my wife was working, I'd go down myself. And I think you'll find it in that book. I'd see this guy standing along the highway, and I'd almost bet that he was a veteran. And I wouldn't dare stop pick him up because you know what you're getting into. But I wrote that poem, I think it was, about this stranger. And said, although the way he's closed everything, I could have been him and he could have been me. Which I firmly believe, you know. I've always believed in fate. But, like I said, I wouldn't want to do it over, but I wouldn't take nothing for the experience. I feel, I, I'm very patriotic. And uh, I used to fly the flag all the time. And had it on my own automobile. I wasn't a fanatic. What I get the most joy out of and recognition is I could go into the parking lot, be getting out of my car, any place, and they could see my license plate. And they come around and say, We've got to talk to you. The Purple Heart license plate. Yeah. And it does me good, and I'm, I hope it does them good, you know, because they want, they've got something they want to let out. I don't know what's going to happen here after. But I've got everything already prepared and everything. And uh, that's something I have to do. I, my kids swear that they're going to put me in a military funeral. They want to have a regular funeral, a military funeral. I said, now you do what? I said, they don't make a difference to me on that. And I wish I'd have kept, I couldn't wear that, but I wish I'd have kept my World War II uniform. That's when I moved to California. I don't want my mother to do I guess the ball stayed it up. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we sincerely appreciate your service. Well, I try not to brag about anything. I, I try to tell the facts as I saw them and, and as I experienced them. And like I said, there's a lot of others. 
I was lucky. They didn't live to tell their experiences. You know, in their World War One, my uncles and I, they would never talk about their experience. But I think my generation, what they know, I think they think it's benefits to others, to them, and especially the other people, to know about these things, like history, in history, you know, because we have so many kids this day, they don't even know anything about American history. They don't even know where the capital is. That's true, I've seen no doubt. But I can thank God that the uprising I had, and I made something a little bit beneficial out of my life. And if I had to do it, I'd do the same thing, except I'd try to be a better person. <laughs> okay. Well, we thank you so much for this interview today. And well, I, I didn't blab along too much. And you did a great job. Uh, we're, we're proud of you. That's the first time I've ever had, so, except interview for a job or something. Okay.